Okay. Um, but a lot of us are sick today, getting a lot of calls today. I'm not going to be there today. I'm so sorry. Um, so you don't have to say sorry to me. You're sick. I'm the one who say sorry to you. I'm sorry you're sick. But um, pray for lots of us that are sick today. And uh, the weather, it just seems to be ongoing. More rain coming. So uh, I would suggest invest in an umbrella, invest in some jackets, invest in some rain gear, because uh, it looks like it's here uh, for some time. Um, so, of course, if you lived anywhere else besides California, this is no big deal. Uh, it's us Californians who take it as a big deal as well. Uh, we need to pray. And we need to pray for uh, just for the fellowship. And uh, I would like to pray for uh, Dwight and, and Jenna. And um, um, Grandma went to be with the Lord, as I shared with you earlier uh, in the, last week. And um, just wanted to pray for them, that the Lord continues to encourage them and lifts them up. And uh, Paul, I know you had a... a death in the family as well. It was a, your brother. And you went to Texas, and you came back, and, you're, and you came back good. So praise the Lord. We're praying for your trip back and forth. So praise the Lord for that. And uh, uh, so I would like to pray for that the comfort of the Holy Spirit would overwhelm each and every one of us, especially those who have lost a loved one in the Lord. There's sorrow, but there is hope. And that's the most amazing thing. There's sorrow, but they have hope. The um, the unbeliever has sorrow with despair. There's no way out. The believer has sorrow with great hope that those who've died in Jesus will come back with him when he comes. And then we will walk with them for a thousand years on this very earth. A renewed earth is what the Bible says, for a thousand years. So no, we just don't have a couple of weeks with them. We have a thousand years plus a couple of weeks with them. And now that they're with the Lord, we have a thousand years to look forward to on the earth with them. So praise the Lord for that hope, that guaranteed hope that the Lord gives through his word and through his spirit. So let's pray together and pray for one another. As the Bible tells us, if one sorrows, we all sorrow. If one rejoices, we all rejoice. So the blessings that should be shared with all of us, as well as the sorrow, even though that's hard sometimes. Lord, we thank you for your every blessing and everything that you allow in our lives. We thank you. We Thank you because in them, Lord, you're working out your eternal purposes. We don't understand, and ultimately, Lord, trials and difficulties in the temporary moment make no sense. But, Lord, we know that you are working all things together for good for those who love you. So help us, Lord, to keep loving you, and things will work out for good according to your purpose in all of us. So, Lord, we pray for Dwight and Jenna. We pray for Frank and Paula. We pray, Lord God, for... Uh, the sorrow that they have. And Lord, it, it is true that Christians have sorrow. Paul told us he had sorrow, and he told the Thessalonians that it was their sorrow for those who have died in Jesus, but sorrow with hope. Let's not sorrow without hope, but sorrow with hope. And that is, we miss them, Lord, and we thank you for their lives and their lives committed to Jesus. But Lord, we hope in the resurrection, the guaranteed that they will be coming with them and with the Lord that will be with us for a thousand years. Thank you for the promise, for all in Jesus has that promise to walk with you, Lord, and reign with you for a thousand more years on this earth. And so, Lord, we ask you today that you would comfort our hearts, but also, Lord, elevate our hearts to worship and to thank you and to praise so that we will, Lord, receive from you that which we have for us today. We come to you, Lord, with thankful hearts, worshipful hearts, grieving hearts, heavy hearts, but Lord, we are expecting from you to give of your spirit to us what we need. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So our title of today is Walking in the Church. And I don't mean walking in the building. Walking in the church, but I don't mean walking in the building, although that is normally what we say it's, a, it's church. But the Bible does not address church in the way we would say a building. The church has a building here. This is the building of the church. The believers are the church, the body of Christ, called out to serve and worship God. And we were worshiping God today. The building wasn't worshiping God. The church was worshiping God. Individuals that have been called by God to live a new life in Jesus. And we are to worship God, even at times of difficulties and hardships. Paul is going to deal with something that all of us need to be reminded as a church. is how to walk in the church. But when you worship... You're ascribing worth to God. That's the idea of worship. It's ascribing worth. 
It's not just the idea of bowing down or singing a song, but how much worth is God to you? How, is he, how much worth it is he? Uh, what's the worth that you ascribe to Jesus? Uh, how valuable is he, we would say. And uh, that also has the idea of glory, you know, how much God weighs, the glory, the heavy. How heavy is God in our lives? How worthy is he of our praise and our worship? Well, that is supposed to be done in the church. Don't expect the world to worship God, but we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. And Paul is going to address these things in Ephesians 4. I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there. Let's read verse 1 of chapter 4. Walking in the church. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, uh, this is Paul speaking, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility, gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. That's a packed verse right there. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as there's, you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, and all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of us, a grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity, a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some of the evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. And for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until all attain the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure and stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As, as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him, who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body, being fit or fitted and held together by that which joint by every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. It's a lot in that scripture, but we have been reach, read, reading Ephesians, and we have read the first three chapters, and all refer to what we are to believe. We are to believe in the right teachings regarding Jesus, regarding the church, regarding Christ, regarding God, regarding our place in him, our salvation, good works done because we've been called to faith. All those are part of the sitting part. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places, even today. You are seating today at 1431 Devore Road, but in God's perspective, if you're a Christian, you are seated together with Christ in high places, in heavenly places, with Christ. That's God's plan for all people is to be saved. Now, the church is the one, the believers are the ones who respond in faith and uh, in obedience. They respond, they become Christians. God has seated us with Christ in heavenly places. All the first three chapters were all about what you need to believe. All three chapters, all that you need to believe, the gospel, the assurance of salvation, God's grace, the gift of God through faith, how we are to uh, respond in good works and obedience to God. And this is chapter 3, where he talks about how Gentiles and Jews have come together. There's no division anymore. There's no wall of partition. Jews in Christ, as well as Gentiles in Christ, are the same. There's no difference anymore. It is absolutely one person, one new humanity that God has created. It's not just Jew and Gentile. It's now Jew, Gentile, and Christians. That's the third humanity God has created. There are Jews, yes. There are Gentiles, yes. But there are Jews and Gentiles together in Christ. That is the new humanity that God has created and therefore, God wants all people to be in that humanity, not just being born as a Gentile, not just being born as a Jew, but being born again into the new humanity. 
by the Spirit of God to be a Christian. That's what God desires for all men, the new humanity. That's chapter 3. Chapter 4 is now that you know this, you need to act on it. And you need to live it. And this is the part of walking. And you can summarize Ephesians in three parts. Sit, walk, and then chapter 6, stand against the devil. Stand against the wiles of the enemy. So you're seated with Christ in high places. You are walking in the church with Christians. You are walking in the world. That's next week. And you're going to stand against the devil. All because of what the first three chapters have done for you. If you got the first three chapters, then it's time to put it into action. Chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6. Now you need to take a stand. And um, I would say a lot of Christians just finish in chapter 3, and they say, well, I know what I believe. And they never move on to walking, and they never move on to stand against the devil. So let's read the first part. Walking with Christ. Paul, a prisoner of the Lord. I am here because Christ has called me to be an apostle, and Christ has called me to serve him, and Christ has called me to plant churches. It's what Paul is saying as a prisoner. I entreat you to walk. I entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of his calling. We'll come back in a minute. But Paul is encouraging us to walk. Why? Paul has all authority to do it. Why? He is an apostle. But you see that he doesn't say he's an apostle, therefore you should do this. Right? What does he say? Paul, a prisoner. Paul, a prisoner. He could have said, Paul, an apostle, and we should all perk up because he saw the risen Christ after he ascended. But he says, I'm a prisoner. And anyone who has suffered for the Lord, anyone who has served time for serving Jesus and being because of Jesus that were put in prison should be listened to, should be heard because of Christ. But Paul is a, it's talking about his own suffering before he even talks about his calling as an apostle. It's all through his letters. You, you watch and read. Paul doesn't come out and say, look, I'm an apostle, I saw Jesus, you should listen to me. He always talks about his beatings, his marks, his sufferings, how he served the Lord in great suffering and great pain. And this was all for the body of Christ. And then he says, then, um, that's, that's the reason why you should listen to me. Yeah, I've done miracles. You know, the Lord has used me tremendously in that, but that's not the point. The point is, I bear the marks of Christ. That's what Paul would address. That's his humility in addressing us today, is we should listen to Paul because of that reason. He's going to talk about a few things here. He's going to talk about two things, and that's all this is 16 chapter, 16 verses are all about. Number one is unity and diversity. God wants a church that's united but diverse. We'll explain what that means. Christ wants the church that's united but diverse, meaning that even though there's unity, you're not a clone of each other. Right? God likes diversity, and usually we think of diversity as you know, race and things like that. That's part of it, but it's diversity of ministry and diversity of gifts. God doesn't want everybody to have the same gift. Is that fair enough to say? And he doesn't want one person to have all the gifts. All right? God wants all the gifts to be within the body to each individual person. Why? Because it's a body. If, we, if you had all the gifts and I had all the gifts, who needs everybody else, right? We just got together and we just serve the Lord and worship Christ and nobody else can come. But God wants to have gifts throughout the whole body. But there's unity in that, but diversity. And only God can do that. We'll explain that. And then the second one is God wants maturity with love. God wants maturity, maturity in the word, maturity in the truth, but with love. And we'll get to that in a moment. So Paul is writing as an, uh, as, a, as an apostle to walk. And he says, what, how are you to walk? Verse 1, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Some translations have it vocation. Some translations have it as vocation. But it is the word calling. But it, if, if it is vocation, that's fine. But the Bible doesn't mean what you do for a living, your job. What the Bible means is your character. Walk in a manner worthy of of the character, right, of the calling which you have been called. You have a calling. And it's not just being an electrician or a plumber or a teacher or diversities of employments that we have here. 
what God refers to calling is your character. Your character. Not your, what you do for work is your character. So if you're focused on what you do in your character, then your job is just a platform to display your character for the glory of God. You're there to serve Christ. You're not just there to get a paycheck. You're not just, although that's part of it, you're not just there to fulfill your career. You're there to glorify Christ, and that is your calling. Now, take a look at this. I've been called to be a pastor, a teacher. You've been called to do something else. We've been called to do something different. But our true calling is godliness. I have been called to be, besides a pastor and teacher, spent 17 years in the corporate world, I was called to be a godly man. That's my calling. And ladies, your calling is to be a godly woman, despite of what you do. In fact, the Bible puts little emphasis on what you do. It's not important what you do. It's important how you do it. That's what the Bible is concerned about. It doesn't matter what you do. The Bible doesn't put emphasis one above the other. It doesn't say, well, if you're a high executive, you're worth more than the, the plumber. If you're working you know, telecommunications, you're worth more than the guy who works with his hands. It's not the, the Bible doesn't put those things in, the, in those perspectives. We do. But the Bible says your job, your calling, your true calling is your character. How are you doing in your character? It doesn't matter what you do, it's how you do it. And it is, for, it is for the glory of God. And that's our vocation, godliness, godliness. So when you go to work and you're there in your work, is it in godliness? Is it a way to exalt God? Is it a way to uh, bring glory to God? And look what it says is, is that you would walk, walk worthy. And the word walk simply means to go in one direction, one step at a time, right? In the right direction, I should say. Go into the right direction, one step at a time. That's what Christianity and faith is all about. It's a walk. Time and time again, I've been, I've been pointing to verses like this because it comes up over and over again. Christianity was never meant to be a one-night stand you had with the Lord one day in some place. That's not ever what it was intended to be. It is always called a walk. One, the right direction, one step at a time. Right direction, one step at a time. And it's a walk of faith, and it's a walk of love. And that's what Paul is pointing to. Not that you have believed on Christ. Now walk. And what is the first thing he says? Walk in a manner worthy. Your character. The second thing he's going to talk about now, it's unity. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Unity is a supercharged word today. It is a big buzzword. Unity, unity, unity. Everybody wants unity. But nobody asked the question, unity in what? And unity toward what? They just, unity, that's it, unity. And they never asked the right questions. Unity has almost become an idol in the church. It's become part of idolatry. Forget what anybody believes, just unite. Just close your eyes, doesn't matter. And that's not what Paul is referring here. For the first three chapters, he laid down good doctrine. What we are and who we are in Christ and what we believe and what we hold to. Now that you have that unity, you got to keep it. And so the question has always been this. Is unity something that you need to, at all costs, try to keep because if you don't do it, it's not going to work? Or is unity in the faith, unity in the truth, is that unity something that it's already there and we can't lose it? Right? Is unity something that you have to do, otherwise it won't work? Or is unity something that is existing already that you can't lose? Yeah as you'll find something very interesting in the Bible. The Bible holds those two things together. It is something that you must practice, and it's something that already exists that you cannot lose, but it's something that you must practically do. And I'll explain that in a moment, because this is many, much, many times in the Bible, there's two sides to the truth. The Bible's full of that. There's two sides to every truth. Yes, unity is something that is found in God, and therefore has not a whole lot to do with you, but unity is also something that he calls you to have and calls you to practice. Look at the first one. Unity. What is the unity that we're to practice? Verse 2. Humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance. That's the word high tolerance. 
a high tolerance for one another. That is the four things that you are to practice in order for you to have unity. The four things that must exist in any church that is united in the truth, if we're going to keep that in this church, in this body, we are to practice those things. And you can't practice them by yourself. Don't, you know, don't think of it for a moment that I'm just going to home and just, just going to stay away from every Christian and just practice being humble and being gentle and being kind and being good and being high tolerance for myself. It's referring to walking with other people. And when you walk with other people, don't you need humility and gentleness? And don't you need uh, patience and high tolerance for other people? Well, yes, and humility. So just real quick, what does these words mean? Because we could attach all kinds of meanings to them, but this is what the Bible means, humility. Um, it's how God's, when you have humility, it's when you see yourself the way God looks at you. If you see yourself the way others see you, that's going to lead you to depression. <laughs> if you see yourself the way yourself sees you, sometimes that could be a little misguided. But when you see yourself the way God sees you, there is a point of humility. Where he says, I don't know why he loves me that much. I don't deserve it. I know me. <laughs> I know me. I know my faults. I know my cripplings. I know my handicaps. I know what I'm not capable of doing. But he gives me the grace, and he loves me. And there's a point when you say, I don't deserve any of it. And it humbles you. He says, I don't deserve to be here. Only God's grace. The second one is the word meekness. And that's the word for gentleness. It doesn't mean weak. It simply means you don't really care about your reputation. You don't really care about your reputation. You're not there to seek your reputation. You're not there to um, basically take offense. You're not there to um, seek your own revenge. It's simply... A person that no matter what happens, they are not, they're going to stay the same. No matter what happens, they're going to stay the same. Meaning meekness has to do with you don't take matters into your own hands to get back at someone. Even if you're wronged, even if they were wronged or you were wronged. Meekness. And you let God take care of those things. Vengeance is mine, the Lord says. Uh, this is what he promises, that he'll take care of it. But it's somebody who's not easily offended. Somebody's not easily offended. You know, it's a really big thing in churches. It's offense. Offense. Now, the Bible says, Jesus says, woe to that man who is easily offended by me. Because the disciples were offended at times what Jesus said. And they're like, how could you say that to them? You know, we need to get them into our church. You know, the, the 12th. We need to get these people to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus was not about the crowd. And he warned them. He said, woe to you that is easily offended by what I say. And I figure sometimes in the church people get offended by what was said, by what wasn't said, by what was done. And somebody who's meek is not easily offended. No matter what happens, they stay consistent. They stay the same. Number three, patience. You heard of the word short-tempered? Maybe you've been called that. Right? It's the opposite of that. Long-tempered. The word patience has to do with long-tempered. Being long-tempered. You know so you know what that means, right? So instead of being short-tempered, you're just long-tempered. You know somebody who's short-tempered? Like, fired up like that? Somebody who's the opposite. It just takes a long time to get them to that point. And somebody's very patient with somebody, somebody who doesn't get offended, they're meek, and they have a long-tempered. And then the last word, of course, is the real acid test. Forbearance. What does forbearance mean? Well, there's a translation there, high tolerance for one another. I like this one. Making allowance for others' weaknesses. Making allowance for others' weaknesses. Oh, man. Forbearance. Putting up with other people. Even they're different than you, and you don't really think that they should be doing that. But then at, at the same time, you know, it's a weakness. You know, somebody may not be very patient. Somebody may not be, but you are, because you're practicing these things. And you just have to put up with it. Long-tempered, putting up with other people's weaknesses and being okay with them at the same time. This is not referring to sin. This is not putting up with sin. This is not talking about somebody in sin, outward sin. Uh, this is relating to unity in the church and what we're to practice. We're to practice humility, meekness, patience, and forbearance, putting up with one another even though you may not want to. 
That's something to be practiced in the church. If those two things, those four things are in action, you'll have what verse 3 says. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What's going to keep that together if we're practicing those things? It'll be a glue, peace. If we're practicing those four things, it'll be peace within the relationships of every Christian. Your wife, your husband, fellow believers, brothers and sisters, if you have if you practice those four, remember, it's something that you're to be diligent. You're to be diligent doing this. There'll be a peace. There'll be a glue that will hold you together, and that will be the peace that comes, the unity of the Spirit, and the bond of peace. Now, that is what we're to practice, but there's also a foundation. Look at verse 4. There's a foundation of unity that you and I cannot lose. We can stop practicing those four actions that we talked about earlier, but there's a unity now that is not dependent on us. It's dependent on this truth. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and in all. It's like Paul got excited and just went on and right. Verse 6, God is that big. He is in all, through all. Right? He knows everything. He's powerful over everything. But what is the foundation to do? Your foundation is to remember that God is one. The unity that exists among Christians is based on who God is. Who is God? He is one. He is God. He is a father. He is a son. And he is spirit. And all three of the persons of the Godhead are mentioned in this verse, in this, uh, this passage, that it is based on God, his uniqueness. There's only one God. There's three persons in that Godhead. And that is a perfect harmony. You don't see the Holy Spirit having an out with Jesus, do you? You don't see the Father being upset with the Holy Spirit and not talking for a week or being offended at what somebody else said, right? There's that perfect unity and harmony that is in the Godhead. That is the example of unity that is to be in the church. Right? Paul is referring to that. That is the foundation. The foundation of our unity is God is one. There's a unity there with the three persons of the Godhead. And it has nothing to do with you. It's just there. This is what I'm saying. You can't lose that one because it's not based on you. It's the unity that we have in Christ already. Now, it's the hope of a calling, it says. In verse 4, the hope of your calling. There's one body. If there's one God, then there's one body, the church. There's not two bodies, there's not three bodies. It's one body, the church. That means you have the same hope of your calling. Christians, you have the same hope as the other Christian next to you. The hope of eternal life. That same hope. You were saved by the same hope that they have. And it's unbelievable. You, you may not get along with them. You might not think too much of them. You might not be too fond of them. You might be irritated by them. But you know what? That doesn't matter. Because they have the same hope that you have. The hope of your calling is salvation. You were saved by the same salvation that they have. And it talks about the Spirit. There's one body and one Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that is ministering to you. You know, you're reading a passage. Maybe you're in church. Maybe the Holy Spirit's touching your life, even right now, touching your heart, pointing things out, opening your eyes. That same Holy Spirit, that same person is also touching your brother and sister with the same understanding of that text, of the same comfort, of the same love. You see how it works? It's, you can't say, well, the, the Spirit, you know, he talked to me, and you know, I'm at odds with that guy. He, the Spirit shouldn't talk to him. It's like, well, who are you to tell the Holy Spirit who to talk to and not to talk to? It's the same Spirit. You are united in one body. You are touched by the same Spirit. You have the same future, the same hope of your calling of eternal life. There's in a lot of unity already, isn't there? Uh, so if, if Christ called you to, to save you, is call, if Christ called you to save you, he also called to save the next person, the person next to you. And so you have a future together. And instead of waiting for eternity to say, well, we just get along in heaven. That's really, that's really the point. We're just going to, you know, I can't deal with it, but we're just going to get along in heaven. Paul says, why don't you get along now? Why don't you be united now? Why don't you put down your weapons, the weapons that you hold to, your offenses that you're holding on to, whatever bitterness or clamor or whatever things you're holding on to, and realize that you are one. One body. Like in marriage, it's like one body. One spirit. 
one calling, especially marriage, right? Amen. All the married people say amen, right? United, and that unity cannot be lost because it's based on God. And God is not going to be at odds with himself. And God's not going to change his plans of eternity. And he's not going to change the plans of our calling. Now, the other thing that we have is one Lord. Verse 5, one Lord. This is referring to Jesus, of course, our Lord Jesus. When you became a Christian, you came to a person. You came to a person, right? You might have gone to church. You might have heard it in a radio. You might have done it in your room. You met Jesus in an individual way, in a personal way. You came to a person. You didn't come to a philosophy. You didn't come to a book. You didn't come to an enlightenment. You came to a person who saved you. You know, the same person saved the neighbor next to you or your brother and sister. The same person. I met Jesus in 1995. I don't know when you met him, but in 1995, uh, part of the body of Christ now. And you can't get rid of me. Love me, hate me, like me, whatever. You know, it's, it's not based on you. And people may be at odds with me. People will be complaining about me and just like, I love you. I'm sorry. I'm in the body of Christ, and so are you. So we have one Lord. We have the same Jesus. In fact, what Paul is going to be relating to is that we have one Father. That's in verse 6. But before we get to that, he says, one Lord, one faith. That faith in Jesus, that trust that you have when you met him, right? Did you trust him that day? And then you were baptized. That's what Paul is saying. One faith, one baptism. Notice the order, right? You trust, and you're baptized into the body of Christ. All because of Jesus. The same person who saved you is the same person who saved her and her and him and him. And it's like, we're united already. Right? It's only the verse three that we, uh, verse two that we have a hard time with, right? Because we have to practice those things. But that unity has exists already, and that's because we have one God. Verse six: We have one God and Father. That's a beautiful thing. We have one God and Father. There's only one Dad. You and I have the same Dad. And if I read the book of Hebrews correctly, Jesus is my older brother. That's what it says. Believe me, read it. Yeah. That's what it says. You and I have the same father, and we have an older brother named Jesus. By faith and to the body of Christ, you and I have the same dad. You know, I have five kids, and sometimes uh, they don't act like they're united. I don't know how it is in your home. They have the same dad. They do have the same dad. They don't act like that sometimes. And sometimes you have to put them in different rooms and different places so they can actually be able to function. But ultimately... They can't get rid of each other. And it's the same thing if you are a Christian. If you are a Christian, if you are in the body of Christ, that's how it is. It's one father. You might be in a, at odds at one point. But father knows best. Remember that show? Father knows best, and he's going to make sure that person A and person B are going to get along. Because we have a unity. And that unity is because of God. God is our uniting factor. And secondly, we have to... Act on that unity. That's what the overall uh, theme is in verse 2. Practice that unity. Continue in that unity. Strive to keep that unity. We have a unity that is our foundation, God. He's one, one body, one Lord, one baptism, one faith, one God, one Father. We all have the same. The other one is the hardest one for Christians to do, right? Because we're easily offended not very humble toward one another. We're not very gentle to one another. We're not very kind to one another, right? And we always think we're right, and the other person is wrong. <laughs> and therefore, lack humility. We lack gentleness. We lack forbearance. And God says, you know, you got to strive to keep that unity. Yes, we have a unity that cannot be lost, God. If we stay in him, that unity will continue. But the other one needs to be practiced because we can fall out with other Christians. And Paul is saying, this is the church that God wants, united in the Spirit, by practicing those things that are, that are based on the reality of God. Everybody all right with that? Okay. That is, that is unity. Now, diversity, remember diversity? Unity with diversity? Here it comes. But each one, grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive of a host of captives, and when he, gives, when he gave gifts to men, now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except he also descended into the Lord's parts of the earth? He who descended in himself is, is, is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. 
And he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors, teachers, for the equipment of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Diversity. Not one of us here is the same. Not one. And yet, we're called to be united. How does God accomplish that? With different backgrounds, cultures, personalities, temperaments. How can God ever do this? And it's a miracle, really, how it happens every Sunday. How we can be united, because we're united in Christ. We're united in God. We have the unity of the Spirit. But here is, we're not clones. It's not like, um, it's not a cult. You know, here are the reading points. Here are the talking points. Just follow this, look like this, wear this, dress like this tomorrow. We're going to be united. That's not unity. That's what they call uniformity. Uniformity is, here's the talking points. Make sure you memorize them for next week, right? And make sure you dress like this and wear a nice little hat and let's all wear white robes tomorrow or something like that, right? We all try to be one. I'm the outward, right? God is not interested in uniformity. He's, he's interested in diversity, unity with diversity. How does God accomplish this? Well, first of all, there's no difference between laity and clergy. That's the first thing that we need to get rid of in our thought. There's no difference between laity and clergy. You know, you know talking about denominational things. You know, the laity, you guys don't know anything. The clergy, they're a higher grade. You know, the priest, the pope, whatever, they're, they're a higher grade. There's nothing like that in the Bible. The Bible doesn't talk about that at all. In fact, it only says the difference is only in ministries and gifts. That's the only difference. Ministries and gifts, meaning that you may have other gifts, and you may do a ministry with those gifts that is different than the one God called me to do with the gifts and the calling that he gave me are different than the one he gave you. Isn't that wonderful? that I can do something that God called me to do, and you can do something Christ called you to do, and it's going to be different. But they complement each other because it's the body of Christ. It's diversity. What if everybody had the same gift? What if everybody had the gift of tongues here? Boy, you wouldn't be able to do a service. Everybody would want to talk. Right? What if everybody had the gift of teaching? Take turns. Everybody get a minute. Right? What if everybody had the gift of whatever? Just go down the line. It, it doesn't work like that. The Bible says, he gave gifts unto men. And by the way, when you think of the minister of the church, when we think of who's the minister of the church? It's normally everybody think. The person up here. <laughs> You're the minister of the church. You know what I tell people? I'm not. You are. According to the Bible, the ministry is done by the body. They are the ministers of the church. You are to minister. Oh, I, that's why we pay the pastor to do. No, that's not why. <laughs> the minister are the saints. The minister. So somebody complains, comes out, well, I don't like the way the ministry is going. I said, not me neither. You should do something about it. That would be, oh, no one's going to ask me that ever again, right? Because that's the reality of Scripture. The Bible is, the ministry is done by the saints. And therefore, if the ministry is going wrong, there could be something wrong with maybe the leaders. That's often the case, right? But maybe there's something wrong with the laity, the people, the ministry, not being done because people don't want to do it. And therefore, Paul says, you have a unity, and that unity is in Christ, but there's diversity of gifts. Look at verse 7. Christ gave something wonderful. To each of us has been given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. And there's a play on word here, grace. And it can also mean gift, kindness, the grace of God, the kindness of God. But when Christ did something, Christ did something, and he gave gifts to the measure of Christ's gift according to grace. Something so important to remember. Please remember this. If there's only thing that you remember today is this. Gifts are grace. Calling is grace. You have the grace to do something for Christ, right? It's not necessarily you have a gift, like, I have the gift of teaching, so I can take it everywhere I can, and this is my gift, and you can't have it. People act like that. It's not like that. In the Bible, it's not true. The Bible says you have the grace to teach. You have the grace to minister. 
It's only through the grace of God. And it's not even for you. I said that last week. It's to the body. It's for the body through you, but it's for everybody. The gifts are for everybody. There's a ministry going on. There's a service that's going on. We'll get to that at the end because Paul talks about service and equipping. So who gave all those gifts? Christ. When did he do it? I just kind of asked the question. When, when, how? You know, when did he do this? Well, he gave gifts unto men so the work will continue on the earth. Jesus did all those things. The only exception about gifts, the only person that had all the gifts was Christ. He's the only exception. When Christ was on the earth, he could do all those things. He was, he's Christ. He had all the gifts through the power of the Spirit. When he went to heaven, when he ascended from the Mount Olives, when he got to heaven, he showered the church, the body of Christ, with gifts. So the work of Christ will continue. So his work will continue through the gifts that he gave. Does that make sense, everybody? When he ascended, he got to heaven, he said, my work needs to continue. But I'm up here. I am going to shower the church, the body of Christ, with all my gifts. And I'm going to give some to you, some to you, some to you, some to you, some to you. Each one gets a gift or more, and you are to work in that ministry that he's called you to do. He gave gifts unto men. And he didn't give them to one person, by the way. He gave gifts unto men. This was very real in the ancient world. Did you realize in the ancient world, this was, you can go today, go to Rome. Maybe not today. Depends when you want to go. But go to Rome, and you go, they take you to these, um, I've seen them on National Geographic. It's like crazy. I'm like, National Geographic is showing this? Like the most like, ungodly channel. You know? But you go there, right, because they talk about you know, Jesus wasn't true and stuff like that. But they take you to Rome, and they go to this place, and they have this the Arch of Titus, right? They have the Arch of Titus, and they have these paintings of the Roman legions coming back from wherever war they fought, and they come, and, the, and all the you know, armies shouting triumph, yeah, we won. And then here comes the general, and the general of the army, what is he doing? And even on those paintings, he's giving gifts to the people. He's showering the people with gifts. The spoils of the conquering, he's given it to the people. This is exactly what Paul is referring to. They would have understood it as Gentile, Ephesian Gentiles. Right? They would have said, that's what the Roman general does when he comes back from a war and he triumphs. Yes, Jesus has triumphed. He triumphed over death. He triumphed over sin. He triumphed over the devil. The spoils, the gifts, he showered us with it. So the work of the ministry will continue in his name. So the body of Christ will continue the work. Not one person, all of us together make up the body of Christ so his hands and feet and body can continue to work. Now what did he give? When he ascended, it says, he led captivity of host captives and he gave gifts unto men. It's quoting from the Old Testament. Now I don't have time to get into it today, but there's a whole study here you can do on where Christ went to Abraham's bosom what Christ did with those who have died in faith in Jesus, and he took them with him up to heaven in triumph. Those who had died in Jesus prior, prior to his death and his resurrection, they had died in faith, and Jesus took captivity captive. Whole other story, uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't fit the time. I'm almost running out of time, and i got to get through this. But what did he give? He ascended, verse 9, when he ascended, he also descended to the Lord's parts of the earth. Verse 10, he who descended is himself also who ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Verse 11, and he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets and evangelists, pastors and teachers. Now, here's what he did. These are mentioned here. There's more gifts, the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. You can read that on your own, but these are the gifts that Christ gave here. Apostles, prophets. Pastors, teachers, they are gifts. They are gifts to the body of Christ. A specific reason for it. What's an apostle? Before we can think of an apostle, think of the 12. The 12 apostles who followed Jesus, right? The one was replaced by Matthias. Judas was gone. Matthias came in. But Paul came in later. Like you say, it's maybe a 13th apostle. Those are unique. They're unique apostles. There'll never be anybody like them, ever. Forget it. You think you're one of them, you lie. Right? That's not it at all. They're unique. They're actually, once John passed away and went to be with the Lord, that was the last of those apostles. Who were they? 
Just read the book of Acts. They were the ones who were there from the baptism of John, who saw the death of Jesus, who were there at the death of Jesus, who saw the risen Lord. By the way, that's why Paul couldn't be one of the 12. Which qualification, qualification did he miss? He was not there at the baptism of John. He did see Jesus, right? He did see Jesus, the death and resurrection of Jesus. He did see Jesus rose from the dead. He saw the ascended Lord. But he could not qualify to be the apostle because he was not there from the baptism of John. It was a very strict, very strict um, uh, criteria to be an apostle. Why? They needed to go back to the time of John so they could understand repentance and they could see the beginning of the ministry of Jesus and his miracles and his works. It couldn't be secondhand information. Paul would have gotten it secondhand. Does that make sense? He couldn't. Okay, so those 13 are absolutely closed. Sorry, you can't be one of them. As much as you love the Lord. Unique because they were inspired to write doctrine. That's where we got our Bibles. We got our Bibles from the apostles. We're founded, we read that a couple of weeks ago, on the doctrine of the apostles and the prophets. Absolutely. Now, there are other apostles in the Bible later on. And those are the ones that exist today. The word apostle just simply means to be sent. To be sent. In fact, some, uh, later on in the, in the early church, they started calling them apostles. They calling them by their, uh, by their Latin name, where we get our word missionary from them. They call them missiles. It was a Latin name. We get our word missiles from that. We get our word missionary from that. Somebody who's sent out like a missile. That's an apostle today. A church planting missionary is an apostle today. Apostles do exist. It is a gift from God. It's a gift from Jesus. But not like the 12, not like Paul. Those were unique. Are there apostles today? Yes. People that are sent by the church to plant churches and share the gospel. Those are called church planting missionaries, otherwise known as apostles. Okay, does that make sense? Just want to make sure because it's always a question about that. Because you're going to see somebody on TV says, I'm apostle so and so. I'm apostle this, I'm apostle that, but he's never been a church planting missionary. I go, what is he an apostle of? Who sent them and where did he go? He's not. That's the problem. It's just a lie. An apostle, the Bible says, it's somebody who sent out. Now, what is a prophet? There's another one that people say, I'm a prophet. Sorry to disappoint. There's no Old Testament prophets anymore. There's no Elijah. There's no Jeremiah. There's no Isaiah. There's no Nahum. There's nobody like that anymore. Why? They were unique to Israel, but they were unique in that they wrote down Scripture also wrote down scripture. So it's a very clear criteria about a prophet. Now, are they prophets in the New Testament? Yes. Agabus, right? There's the, the daughters of Philip, right? They were prophets. What is a prophet? Because people make a big deal about it. The word prophet just simply means somebody who speaks forth the word of God. Who speaks forth the word of God. Pro is a word for forward. Somebody who speaks forward. That's all it is. Somebody who speaks forward the word of God, who's been called by God to speak the word of God forward. Not just in preaching, not just in teaching, but if there's something of, of prophets uh, calling of repentance, somebody calling back to repentance, coming back to God, pointing back to the scripture, right? Somebody that's called to be a prophet is in those terms. It's somebody who is, speaks forth the word of God in that way to bring the church back to repentance, bring the church back to the word of God. They're not sent to the world, by the way. They're sent to the church. Now, it may include a prophetic gift in terms of the future, a foretelling, a, fo uh, a forward telling of the future. It may include that through the gift of a prophet, but it's not referring to, you know, he's just always going to talk about the future. You know, what's, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? That's not a prophet. Strictly speaking, in the Bible, it's somebody who speaks the word of God forward with anointing of the Spirit, calling the church back to repentance and getting back to the word of God. That's always been the call of a prophet, especially in the New Testament. Now, pastor, teacher, well, that one's an easy one, I think. But it's unique because it's, uh, oh, we're missing one more, evangelist. Evangelist, somebody who goes out and shares the gospel. That's an easy one right there, share the gospel. We have people in our fellowship that have the gift of evangelists. They go out, and there's a boldness about it. 
you know, all of us, and, and I want to clarify something. It's not referring to that these are the only people that can speak forth the word of God, and these are the only people that can share the gospel, right? It's not referring to that. It's referring they have a calling, a gift, uniquely to do that. But we're all called to be evangelists. To do the work of an evangelist, I should say. We're all called to do the work of an evangelist. But an evangelist is like this. I put it this way. You know what the difference between an evangelist and somebody who has uh, the gift of being an evangelist or somebody who just goes out and evangelizes? It's like going fishing. An evangelist who has the gift, the calling of an evangelist, he'll take a net. You and I will take a rod. Does that make sense? I don't get it. When you go out fishing, what do you expect to get? <laughs> I hope I get one. <laughs> That's me. I hope I get one. And just wait. An evangelist says, what's everybody standing around? Hey, come here. Let's share the gospel. Here's my net. Let's get everybody in that group and bring them to Christ. That's the way they operate. That's the way they think. That's what an evangelist thinks like. And if you don't think like that, you may not be an evangelist. But some of you guys think like that. So it's like, maybe God's calling you to do that. Now, pastor teachers are uh, uh, also very unique in the sense of, it, it, I may get technical here. For, forgive me for being technical. In the original language, it's one gift, not two here. In the original language, it's not two, pastor and a teacher is pastor-teacher. It doesn't come out in the English really well. But look it up. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. It's pastor-teacher, meaning that a pastor has to teach. You can't be a pastor unless you can teach. And sometimes people go, oh, I'm just a pastor. I don't teach. That's not a pastor. A pastor has to be able to teach in order to be a pastor. Now, there's teachers who are not pastors, that's true. But if a pastor is called to be a pastor, he must be able to teach. Elders must be able to teach, that's what the Bible says. Pastor, teacher. All right, those are the gifts that Paul mentions here. Five. Nobody has all five in their personality, in their person, right? Nobody has those five. You ever heard of a five-fold ministry and people like the five-fold ministry? I got the five. Well, first of all, it's four. That's one. <laughs> and secondly, these are uniquely given to people. It's not referring to one person is a prophet. One person is an evangelist. One person is the pastor teacher. One person is the uh, prophet. It's not referring to that. It's referring to the unique gifts that God has given to the body. Now let's continue. We're just about done. For what? What is this given for? Verse 12. For the equipment of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Equipment, service, building. Well, sounds like you're going to do a labor of love again here. We need, a, we need equipment, we need service, and we need to build. All, again, one of those things that we have to read the Bible for what it says. Equipment. What is the equipping for? The equipping of the saints. The equipping of the saints, right? It's basically leading or using your personal resources. Right? Uh, to bring a person to Christ, equipping you to do that. That's equipping. Equipping people to lead people to Christ. Service. Very simple. Things you do for people the rest of the week. The rest of the week? That we just come on Sunday. Well, it's much more important what happens between Monday and Saturday than what happens on Sunday. That's your service. Today, equipping. Know what the Bible says. Know what it means. Know what it's about. So you can worship God in a greater capacity. What do I do with that? Go serve. What you do for others during the week. Building. Building means building up people through encouragement and prayer. You're building them up so they can do the work. That is the essential thing of church or fellowship where we come to a place of unity. Equipping, so you can do service, and we'll build you up so they can work and continue. That is what Jesus gave the gifts for. So the equipping of the saints, the gifts are people. The gifts are the pastors, the, teach, the pastor teacher, the gifts are the prophets, the gifts are the evangelists, the gifts are the apostles. Those are the 
Gifts. What are those gifts for? To equip you. To build you up. So that you can go and serve this world in Christ's name and bring them to Jesus. Somebody came up to Spurgeon one day. I love this story. Spurgeon has these great stories. This guy worked in the fire department. And he came up to Spurgeon, or whatever capacity they had a fire department in those days. And they said to Spurgeon, you know, I, I drive the engine. I drive the truck engine thing. And um, I want to serve Christ. What can I do for the church? And Spurgeon said, um, is your captain saved? And he said, no, he's not saved. And I says, well, then you pray for him. And you share the gospel with them, and you bring them to Christ. That's your service to this church. Did you get it now? Perfect example. You want to know how to serve this church? Take what you have heard. Who, who works with an unbeliever? No, just half of you. All right. The rest of you guys don't work, or are you just off today? Or... All right. If you work with an unbeliever, right? for a long time, then your service to this church, the best thing you can do for this church is win them to Christ. I don't need you to sweep. don't need to clean the windows, although that's nice on Labor Day, right, Roy? It is, it is helpful. Yeah. But that's not your service. That's not your, your service to the body of Christ, to this church, is win people to Christ by equipping you, by giving you confidence in the Word of God, by praying for you, by encouraging you, by saying, Lord, use Scott. Lord, use Brad. Lord, use Dina. By praying for you and building you up and encouraging you. Then you go out and serve and you bring the people to Christ and be like, I did my service for the Lord. I'm going to do service for the Lord this week, right? That's a different capacity. I thought I was just going to like, pass out flyers or something, right? And you could do that, but win them to Christ. Win them to Christ. That's the important thing. Now, finish off. Verse 13 through 16 Go fast. Until, so this is to be done, until we all obtain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure, to the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Maturity now. God wants maturity. I've asked these questions. You guys have older kids, younger kids in between, right? And I always ask this question to parents. What was the perfect age of your kids? When would you like to see them again? And then some parents said, I love them as babies. And then the new moms are going, like, who wants to do that? <laughs> and, you know, as an, older per as an older parent, you go, I love them, babies, hold them. And, you know, I love babies. And they were a fun age. But it was a lot of work, wasn't it? Brad? It's a lot of work. Sergio? It's a lot of work. I think he's back there, right? Yeah, I see him. Um, it's a lot of work. And then you see them grow up. And this is the, they're maturing, right? Uh, God wants us the same way. God wants us to mature. God wants, God doesn't want babies in the church. God wants mature Christians. And what I mean by that is the maturity has to go on from early to older. Not in age, but in spiritual godliness. Are you growing in maturity? This is what God wants. The maturity. Now, I've never met a parent that said, I would like them as teenagers again. Anybody here? I would like my kids as teens. No? Okay, as teens again. Tony? No? All right. I always think of, like, those say, babies, or I think the perfect age, three or four years old, right? Three or four years old. You want your kids to be about three or four? That was a cool. I think 10, 10 11 years old is pretty cool. 10's pretty cool. 10, 11, because ah, they're such a personality, and you get, so, get along with them so well, they, they, they don't think you're dumb yet. You know? <laughs> then, you're, uh, then, uh, then they become teens, and then they really think they're perfect, and you're not. And that's, amen? That's what they think. But anyway, hopefully we grow them, grow them in the right way. But I haven't experienced that yet. But it's such a cool age. 10, 11, 12, it's like, oh, you get along with them so well. Uh, babies. Nobody wants teens. That's a weird thing. But God wants us to mature. God wants us to mature because the greatest satisfaction that you can get, parents, is when you see your kid, you see your children doing adult things, meaning they are mature. They are capable of being on their own. And there's no greater joy, as John the Apostle said, to see my children to walk in the truth, to 
to walk in the truth. What a great joy to see your kids walking in the truth. Amen, everybody here? To walk in the truth. You just, you just sit there and you go, oh, it's all those prayer nights, all those sleepless nights, all those encouragement and late, up, late nights staying up and trying to tell them what was right. It's finally paid off. And you know what? God is the same way. He wants us to mature. And the purpose of this is that we can become united for the, uh, so that we will have the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. What is the mature man looking like? Christ. You're not done until you look like Christ. Pastor, when is that going to happen? When he comes. That means you got to keep walking, baby. you got to keep walking. And I have to make sure my children keep walking. Because the goal wasn't just to get them out of the house. The goal was to get them into Christ and on with him and looking like him. Until he comes, they will look exactly like him. And so you say the goal of Jesus wasn't just to get you saved. Amen? The goal of Jesus wasn't get you to heaven. Those are benefits. Incredible benefits. The goal of Jesus was to make you like him. And he's not going to stop until you look exactly like him. And when does that happen? When he comes. So you just got to keep going. You look in the, you, you know, stand up next to Christ. Am I looking like him a little bit more today? Am I looking like him? You know, it's not a boastful thing. It's like, am I more loving like him? My wife would say, no. Be like, hmm. All right. Got to keep working. Right? Am I more patient like him? Oh, <laughs> am I looking more like him? Uh, a little bit. Oh, God, thank you. There's progress, right? There's progress. There's patience. And God is so patient with us, isn't he? Is he loving? Like, he could have just like, no, you got it wrong again. Boom, done. No, he says, you got it wrong again. There'll be a trial related to that. Just go through it, endure it, and you'll be fine. Be like, again, Lord, please. But he's so patient with us. He's not losing us. He doesn't want to lose us. He wants us to grow. Now, let's look at the last few verses. Verse 14. How do you know when somebody is not mature, though? How do you know when they're just childish, children? Verse 14. As a result, we're no longer children. Talking about immature. Tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of man, the craftiness of deceitful man. How do you know somebody's immature? They don't know what they believe. And as soon as they read another book, they change their beliefs. And they read another book, and they change their beliefs again. And they go see another teacher, and they change their beliefs again. And they go to and fro from every, you know, every teacher. This is guy's good. He's the best teacher. Then they, oh, he's the best teacher. I mean, they, they, they don't believe the same thing. Oh, he's the best teacher. You know what you got there? Children. Childish immaturity. I did not say that. The Bible said it. God wants us to be mature. If somebody goes to and fro from every doctrine, every teacher, every this, immature. Make no mistake about it, immature. Every wind of doctrine, they are victims, not so much victims, but they are given into trickery of man, craftiness of deceitful man. What is that saying? You know the word there, trickery? It's funny. It's a funny word. In the first century, it was used for people who did card tricks. Anybody know how to do card tricks here? All right. You know how you play two card Monty? You ever play two card Monty? Okay. You know that's a that's a you're being set up when you do that. Yeah, three card Monty, two card, you're being set up, right? Uh, you ever been playing with somebody that was completely good at cards and they were just like, oh look at this, look, look right there, and then boom, here's another card. He's got an ace up his sleeve or something like that, right? And you're like, how did you win again? Right? That is the word that is used, that trickery. People that manipulate the word of God in such a way to scheme you. It's a scheme. That's all it is. They scheme you. They just did the card trick thing. They did the verse thing. You know, they quoted a verse here, a verse there, completely out of context, nothing to do with it. And then they say, ha, ah, give me your money. And you go, this is teaching the Bible, right? And people support people like that. The Bible says, no, don't do that. You are being tossed to and fro by the trickery, the card tricks of men. That's a beautiful analogy or, or representation of it, a metaphor of what Paul is saying here. Verse 15 now. Maturity comes from the truth. Maturity comes from the truth. But speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects of him who is the head, and from him the whole body fit together, 
held by every joint, what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building of itself in love. We need to be united in the truth. That's our source of unity, truth. We call our ministry Divorce Truth. Why? Because we need to be united in the truth. But the truth needs to be done in such a way that it is, verse 15, in love. Speaking the truth in love. Some people are very good at the truth and absolutely no love. And some people have absolutely love and they wouldn't know the truth if they hit them on the side of the road, right? And love without truth, it is absolutely too soft. Truth without love, way too hard. But you put them together and you have that perfect balance. And where do you find that perfect balance is Jesus, does not he? He was absolutely truth. Never lied, never cheated, never, never lowered the standard of God. He gave you the truth and gave it to you hard. And he even took people out of the temple. And when you read Jesus, you've got to go, wow, I never read this Jesus. He is adamantly passionate about the truth because he is the truth. But boy, was he loving, wasn't he? Unbelievably love. The picture of love. And you can hear the truth from somebody that, know, that you know has, has the best interest for you and loves you and cares for you, right? And that's what Paul is saying. We need to be united in the truth, but that truth needs to be very much in love toward the individuals who are being tricked, who are being deceived. We need to love them, but you need to tell them the truth. That truth needs to be spoken in love, but that truth needs to be spoken nonetheless. Because there are some people who will say, I don't want to talk about the truth. I just want to love them. I said, you can't. That is a sick love because you don't even know what to tell them. How do you know what love is if you don't know what truth is? You need, first need to know the truth, but when you speak the truth, you need to tell them in love. That's the point of the Bible. Paul uses this wonderful metaphor. Oh, I had this thing. The immature Christian. Oh, well. Anyway. I've met them. It's not even, it is funny, but it is, it's not so funny when you're starting to deal with the issues that they have. Speak the truth in love because Paul is going to make this last point. This whole body needs to be together and they need to come together at the joints. Paul has this like incredible like mind of anatomy here. Body, ligaments, joints, right? He's talking about these things as the body of Christ. What brings us together and what lubricates the body, the joints are a very important part. Where the, where the body parts meet is the joint, right? There's several joints. There's a picture there. And those joints are important. They lubricate. They have this, like, liquid inside of them that's beautiful. It's wonderful. It helps the body, you know, when you get older, you notice joints more, right? <laughs> it doesn't, they don't bend as much as they hurt because they, they wear out and they, they lose the lubrication. Paul is saying the lubrication, when you come together, you got a lot of body parts in the body of Christ, a lot of body parts. But if there's no lubrication, if there's no place of joint, then there's, they can't work. You just have a bunch of parts. But when they come together and there's lubrication, what is the lubrication there? Verse 16 at the end, building up itself in love. We need to have that joint together, lubrication and love, so we can function together. My knee works because, it still does, because there's two body parts have come together and one joint and I can walk. If it didn't, if it uh, had no lubrication, it would hurt a lot. So is the body of Christ. You come together at the joint, love, and work together so that the body is built up, properly working. Each individual part causes the growth of the body. There's a growth of the body. And that growth is not only growth in quality, meaning that there's a growth of individuals who are more Christ-like, but also in quantity, meaning that the Christ-like individuals have gone out to serve and people have come to Christ. So it's increased in quantity as well. The growth of the body. And that's what the body needs. But look at this verse 15 and that's it. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, Christ. That's it. A Christian is someone who is in the body and under the head. Christ is our head. We are united in the truth of Jesus, who he is, what he's done for us, the gospel. 
when we come together, we have to act on those four things that we talked about. Humility, meekness, gentleness, forbearance. And if we're growing up together, we come together at the joints. Lubrication, love. But it's all under Christ, all under the head. And this is so important because Paul is not going to address now how do you walk in the world, but first he had to address how to walk in the church because sometimes that doesn't happen with Christians. Sometimes there's no love, there's no humility, there's no meekness, there's no gentleness, there's no forbearance. It's just an, an, an all-out war. Everybody out for each other, for one another, I should say, for, for, for individual. But Paul says here, no, you need to learn how to walk in the church first. And you do that by loving one another. I'll finish with this. We have a song, Sergio. Are you capable of one more song, Sergio? Everybody can sing. All right. I like that, too. We all can sing. Support Sergio, right? It is more important. This is true in, in, the, real, in, in the real families. It is more important that mom and dad love each other more important than the love that they have for their children. Don't quote me out of context. It is more important for mom and dad to love each other and show that love to their kids than actually you individually loving each one of them. A child that sees no love between his parents, it's a child that has a lot of problems. It's been proven. It doesn't have to be me to tell you that. It's sometimes they're very insecure. Sometimes they're very uh, isolationist. They don't know what love is. They've never seen it within their parents. It is more important. Now, now I'm going to transfer into the body of Christ. It is more important for the world to know and see that you love each other than for you to love the world. And I mean the people in the world. It is more important that the world sees that you love each other and knows that you love each other than for you to go out and love the world. You can go out and win 10,000 people to Christ, but you bring them to a church that doesn't love each other, all the work that you did is for nothing. Guarantee you. You bring people to Christ, but you bring them to a church that doesn't love each other, it won't last. Paul says, love one another first. Let them see that love. And you know, he wasn't the first one who said it. Jesus said, by this they'll know, the world will know, that you are my disciple. By how many verses you have memorized, and how many Sundays you have come, and how many people you have shook their hands. No. It's by the love that you have for one another. That's how they'll know. And it's so important for the world to know that Christians love each other. Because the idea of the world to, for Christians, they're all hypocrites, they don't get along, they don't do anything together. And the world has that. Wrong or right, they have that mentality. You and I are to love each other and change that mentality and say, no, this is real love. You want to show how God is love? I believe God is love. You know how I can prove it? When I love you and you love me. No strings attached. The world's going to say, that never happens. There's something up the sleeve, right? Who's paying off somebody? You know, who lost the bet? Nobody. We just love Jesus. And by that definition, we love each other. Let's pray. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you for all of your blessings and goodness. And I pray, Lord God, for this body, that we will love one another in such a way that it will be demonstrated in the way we treat each other, in love and humility and meekness and patience and forbearance. Lord, help us to practice that. And we need your spirit to help us practice that. Because sometimes we don't believe that this could be done in us. Lord, we don't feel like this is going to be done. And Lord, we just trust you that that unity that exists in the Godhead and in the body through the Spirit and through Christ and our God, Father, we pray that that unity will be in us as well as we treat one another with love and kindness. Lord, help us not to be children tossed to and fro by every false teaching, that we would be cemented, Lord, in the truth. But Lord, we will speak that truth in love so that the body can be built up in quantity and in quality, raising Christians to do the work of the ministry. Lord, we praise you for today, and it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Let's stand and sing this song to our wonderful...